uh, mm -hmm. BE. And then an elective, and I'm missing something else that I can't think of right now. Okay, that was one of the ones you're missing is Spanish, but. Um, ah, thank yeah. you, Peter. And that, it, like the math, is also um, generally leveled um, based on students coming in. But, um, Carissa, are you um, able to answer the question about um, going in and the registration and, and choosing electives on Friday? Is that something that happens on Friday for new students? Hi, everyone. I apologize for the lack of camera. I've been homesick this week. Um, so, with the schedule, you would probably, your student will need to talk to our registrar, Ms. Geertz, after school starts. Um, I don't think she's gonna be making schedule changes um, this week. She's still working on getting the schedules uh, produced. And so um, she'll be doing the bulk of that, getting kids in all of their classes. And then if there's a, a switch that needs to be made, um, then she'll do it after, after school starts. Um, and so, uh, her office, I believe, is A12. It's in that uh, front administrative area of the building. Um, and she has, she always has her door open, so she'll be able to help um, students if there's a, a, a big schedule change. But students might just need to sit tight for a few days um, until she's able to get to their schedule change. So so thank you, Ms. PT. And I'll, I'll get to, I know, Peter, you've got your hand up, and I'll get to you one quick second. I, I would just add to the whole scheduling question obviously right the first week of school students are excited they want to get their schedule want to find out what their who their teachers are going to be uh, miss geertz is very responsive i would just say give her a little bit of grace over the next week when you start school by the end of the first week if not the very beginning of the second week you will have the schedule that you want and that you're comfortable with. And there are always those nuances, parents, right, are just like, how does this fit? Where do I go? How does it get taken care of? Ms. Geert, I can tell you from over the years, is really responsive and, and very, very helpful. There was a question about the CCPS Foundation and how you can donate online. If I'm not mistaken, there is a link on the cottonwoodclassical.org website to be able to to do that. So, Peter, over to you for, for your question. Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening. I was just going to ask um, uh, when we might be receiving schedules for the for the kids. Um, we'll, we won't be able to attend the orientation, so we're just curious um, right. you know, where, where to go, where, where, where to show up on Monday. So it, It's you. my understanding your student schedule will, will be available via Schoology and or PowerSchool on Sunday evening, late Sunday evening, if not before. Um, that's as much as I know. And then um, there, Ms. Petrie in the uh, chat when to confirm that schedules will be available via PowerSchool on Sunday. So if I also am correct, and Ms. Petrie helped me, that first period is with your student advisor. Um, and th those faculty members are there to show support in all ways, not just for scheduling, but navigating around the school, um, you know, helping them out with questions, various questions about teachers, etc. And they will certainly help um, your, your student the first thing um, on, on Monday morning. So first period this year will be um, just a regular class, but the teacher can still help the students. So whichever the first period schedule is, um, all of our teachers are, are also advisors, so they're all prepared to help, um, you know, wh however we can. And, and it might just be in telling students to just hold tight, you know, with their schedule for a couple of days until it can get adjusted. But, um, but it, it will get fixed. It's, it's a, the scheduling is really, to a certain extent, a, <laughs> a one-woman show. Um, and so it's a it's a situation where we just, you know, sometimes have to be patient with the schedule changes, but, but they will definitely happen and, and she will get them um, so that your student is, is uh, scheduled correctly. So yeah, and we also have um, student volunteers that are going to help new students find classes and that kind of thing. And, and um, you know, teachers will be in the halls and that. So it's, it, it's it's a lot more supportive, I think, than we're making it sound right now. <laughs> so um, just, you know, have your students show up on Monday, 
ready to just kind of participate in whatever comes their way. Monday is all seven classes, um, but really all day. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Ramos, Ms. Sarah Ramos, I'll give you be there and be ready to like kind of. Thank you, Pete. I'll, I'll get to those who have their hands up. There was a question about electives. What electives are there to choose from? Uh, Ms. Petri, could do you have those at hand or front of mind uh, that you you may you may comment on? So um, for students, we have you know there's different music classes. Um, there's theater. Um, there's different art classes. Um, and it, it does depend on their grade level, what they have accessibility to. Um, and so, uh, thank you, Jordan. He put in some different classes that are available. Some grade levels don't, don't really have an elective available or they um, may if the students elect not to take a study hall. Um, it depends on the situation, how many students are signed up. Um, but, but we do have, you know, we have, very uh, great uh, arts teachers. Um, they feed into the IB program, and so uh, they take they take pretty serious um, elective classes. They're fun, um, but they're they're really learning a lot. Um, but it, it does depend on their grade level um, and what they have available to them uh, in that grade level. Thank you. Okay, Sarah, over to you. There we go. Um, this kind of goes along with the power school and getting their schedule on Sunday. Um, are we going to get our power school login for Cottonwood between now and Sunday? Because we're still logging into power school at my daughter's old school and we haven't seen any login information. When you come for Jumpstart on Friday, we'll have your directions for power school and we'll actually have time built into the Jumpstart for parents to sign up for power school because it can be a little bit tricky so we have staff members on hand to help make sure that everybody is able to get into power school um, so we will be doing that during jumpstart if you're not able to come to jumpstart uh, miss green can send you those directions um, if you want to email i know miss green has become your good friend over the last few months um, you have probably emailed a lot with her and miss geertz um, for registration she can send you the power school um, logins um, and directions. But we will be doing that for those of you coming to Jumpstart on Friday. Thank you. Yeah, you'll get a whole bunch of information as a new parent uh, during that Jumpstart day. Um, so do, do look for that. Casey, over, over to you. Casey, I think you're muted. Okay, so good question about the advisory class. Uh, Ms. Petrie, do you want to give, or Pete, uh, give, give an overview of that advisory class? Sure. Um, it's something that's been evolving a little bit at Cottonwood. And um, so uh, there are two periods now in the schedule, two time periods where there's advisory, the end of the day on Wednesday and the end of the day on Friday. Um, and it's with the same person for both of those periods and generally a teacher that the student has in their school day or at least is in teaches their same grade level, right? So they're familiar with one another um, and familiar with the coursework that they're doing. Um, the goal is really to um, provide a lot of the, you know, it's conduit for information, it's conduit for um, paperwork, that kind of thing, as well as social emotional support um, we have some, we've used some programs in the past to um, support students in that area. Um, for the older students, I tend to do a lot of things like um, check in with them about college deadlines and, and uh, making sure they're 
reading their emails and and um, and and then we tend to also look at just coursework. What what's going on in English right now? What's upcoming deadlines? That kind of thing. So it's really um, intended to be supportive in multiple ways. Um, and then for students to ask questions. And then in the past, there's also been a component of it where students can access other teachers in that time period to go ask questions and whatnot um, so that they can get clarification on homework or an assignment or make up a test maybe that they missed, that, that kind of thing. So um, in some ways, it's a little bit of a catch-all, but it also it satisf satisfies a lot of those like kind of things that can slip through the cracks if you just stay with a regular schedule all the time. Thank you, Pete. Yeah, I, I can tell you as a parent for a number of years, that advisor really is instrumental in just providing some guidance. Um, if I, as a parent, was kind of questioning even, you know, any one of the, the teachers or classes, I would always go to that advisor and they kind of run interference for you. You kind of get sort of real time answers. And then if you're not getting the answer you like, I know that right, John has got kind of an open door policy, but there's that process, right? Talk to the teacher, talk to the advisor, and if you need anything needs to be, you know, elevated, it goes right on to John. And then everybody is supported in in making that happen. So yeah, great, great point, Lewis. And that's an aspect I left out is that the advisor is kind of eyes on the whole student's schedule and grades throughout and we're doing grade checks and that kind of thing, right? But then individual teachers should be communicating with you directly if there are struggles or missing things or whatnot. But the advisor is like the second check, safety check kind of thing on that and someone you can communicate directly with um, for general school questions or specifics about classes if you're not um, you know, able to reach the classroom teacher or whatnot, I guess. Right. So there were some questions about uniforms and polos and such. I think some of those answers are in the chat window. Um, and then Curtis there has the URL for the uh, foundation website that is in the chat window also. Um, so uh, Casey, did you have another question or are you good to go? Okay, great. Peter, uh, I think you have a, another question. Just just <clears throat> following on the advisory, just imagining that more than one student is is in that session, or is it just a one to one? And if it's more than one student, how does that work logistically? Are they there for an hour kind of reviewing each other's goals? Um, could you tell us a little bit more about how that works? Pete, I'm, I'm going to turn it over. You, you want me to do that one too? Jordan, you want this one? <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Um, yeah. yeah, usually in advisory, we have anywhere between, I would say, you know, 13 to 20 kids, in my case, at least at the ninth grade. Um, so it's certainly not one to one in advisory, right? So we do kind of have to have our eyes on several people at once. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. I, I guess so. I'm, I'm just curious what, you know, how the conversation works. If it's if it's if it's catered towards their goals, wh mm -hmm. what are the kids doing while, you know, another kid is is going over their goals? How how is that time used? So the implementation of that time is, um, it it's not strictly dictated. Uh, there's flexibility within it. Like not all advisors use their time in the same way. Um, I can tell you personally what I do. Uh, the expectation is that grade checks are something that happen normally in advisory, um, usually on a weekly or, you know, bi-weekly basis. Uh, kids are encouraged to sort of self-advocate and take charge of their own grades their own academic performance so we try to encourage kids to you know get on the learning management stuff right get on schoology go look at your grades tell you know tell me your advisor where you stand in different things how you feel about where you stand in different uh, content areas and what you can do to uh, improve a huge part of that that we do is the student-led conference process which happens at least once a semester. 
which is basically that we have students prepare uh, for a conference where they come to it and they literally sit down with parents and advisees and they tell you, hey, this is how I'm doing in this. This is how I'm doing in this. This is where I'm at. This is where I need to be. This is what I need to do to change it. Um, so we try to push those self-advocacy skills and or at least I do. So. Peter, I, I can tell you as a parent over the years, I've seen any number of variations of what Jordan just just described. And I would say generally that time is not only allowed for what you've just heard from both Peter Lukes and Jordan, but also it is a time where if, if the student just need, if they've got an exam or they're preparing for a Socratic discussion coming up in the class that day, that's perfectly fine too. So it's, it's time for the student generally to address prep for a student-led conference, an exam, work on their IB, you know, approach, whatever it might be. And if things are front of mind that are of concern, right, it, 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 you know, one-on-one -on -one dialogue with their advisor is kind of front of mind for, for folks. So I hope that helps just a, just a little bit, right? Yes, thank you very much. So Tracy, I see you have your hand up. I just had a quick question. Hi, sorry, my screen keeps moving. Um, I've been doing a lot of research. We're actually transferring there from Oregon um, the next week and a half. How many uh, students, um, like per class or per grade? Is I, I looked on the research I've done, but I'm just kind of asking what it is generally right now. Per class. I, I must have missed the, the first part of your question. I'm oh, I'm just kind of wondering what the student teacher ratio is in each class. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. You can help me out, but, but it's about 15 to 20 to one right now, I think. Um, yeah, in your middle uh, school, it's a little higher. It's higher now, especially at the beginning of the year. Um, and so it really does, as Jordan just put in the chat, it depends on grade level. Um, some, and so middle school, it's probably going to be 24 um and in some classes perhaps a couple more than that um and that'll stay true and then it like heads to 20 by like ninth grade and that'll stay true for like ninth and tenth um okay maybe 18 um and then there's there's kind of a range in 11th and 12th because the students have um choices in similar subject areas right so um i could take a philosophy course or a psychology course and satisfy the same requirement. So depending on how many students are in those sections and whether or not, um, sometimes it depends on whether or not it's a two year or one year course. And, but those generally are within that range, like 20 to 10, 12. Um, and we, and if we have a smaller student population in 11 and 12 than, um, than in the middle school. Sure, thank you, thank you for that. I can chime in with a little bit of history there too. And first, welcome. Glad you're coming to New Mexico and the school. Yes, thank but you. If you look at the logo that we have, the C, um, you'll see inside the C, uh, there are, I think, 13 or 15 stars. And then there's one on the outside. And at, at the school's beginning, at the founding, you know, the founders had this idea that we would always hover around that 13 or 15 to 1 ratio. So as we've grown right now, we've got new facilities and new buildings being erected. That, I know John, our executive director, has that uh, at the front, front of mind as well. So trying to keep the ratios down, but do get an influx of sixth, seventh, eighth graders in middle school, a little bit larger classes than, than the others. Sure, thank you for that. Well, thank you. Yeah, the other thing that that um, image represents, uh, that graphic represents, is our connection to Paideia, and, um, which is worthwhile to look into. Um, and maybe, Jordan, you can type it in the, in the chat real quick. Um, but in Paideia, you know, it's one of the central components of it is the seminar, right, and Socratic seminar, wherein the, and then the instructor scene is more of an instructional coach, and and so we have coached projects and um, and then some didactic instruction, right? Direct delivery kind of lecture style instruction, but the majority of it's intended to be um, inquiry-based, um, student-centered instruction. And it, it pairs amazingly well with IB, uh, with International Baccalaureate and the, and the 
um, aims and objectives of, of the Interva International Baccalaureate Program, and which we also have components of that go all the way through the entire school from 6 through 12. So lots of questions in the chat window, and Ms. Petri, thank you, thank you for popping all those answers in. I'm hoping everyone is getting answers to your questions. Um, other comments or, or questions for us? No, I'd just like to say as it, oh, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, Tracy, please. No, I just wanted to comment to all of you that doing all my, I've been doing research for a few weeks now and you guys have done, you've got an amazing program there. I mean, we're so excited. And we just got a, we just got in like two nights ago. I didn't think we were going to get a spot and we did. And for two, we're not going to be there for two weeks. But so I just wanted to tell you that, yeah, I'm really, we're really excited about the, the uh, instructional pieces and yeah, just excited. So thank you again for the way that the school is. And so far, our interactions have been amazing. So just wanted to let you all know that. Great, thank great. You. Glad to yeah, hear. Yeah, you. Cottonwood um, has got a stellar reputation. Um, yeah. At, deservedly so. Um, so. Yeah, so thank you for that. Sure. There's a question about uh, school drop-off and the schedule um, in today's email, right? Told we can drop students off as early as 6.50. Understand the classes start at 7.35. Um, what time can students enter the building? I think folks, uh, teachers let them in uh, about 10 to seven or so, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Lukes. Um, don't have the exact time, I, I know. I used to drop my guys off pretty early, um, but I'll let Mr. Lutz or Jordan chime in on yeah. that. Well, and, and Carissa put in there 7.30. Um, it's, there it's also weather driven as well. Yes. <laughs> right? So we're not gonna have a bunch of popsicles out there, so. Right, right. Peter, do you have another question? Comment? It came up in the chat about the school supplies. Um, uh, what what should they bring mine mine is specific to eighth grade but yeah yeah as a parent i've oh, i always waited until students got their syllabus um it was really just kind of dependent on the class and what uh the the teacher was, was requesting there's a range of stuff i know that um teachers like to lighten the backpack load right so they may be asking for just like one notebook or something um, but I, I, my advice would be kind of wait till you get that syllabus and teachers allow you ample time to get what's required and, and, and things and like that. That's my experience. Yeah. And we also provide students with agendas. So, you know, like a, a schedule planner kind of thing so that you don't need to run out and get that either. So I would, you know, a simple notebook, some writing utensils, Chromebook, because they'll be logging into Schoology and getting those kind of things. Um, charger for the Chromebook. Don't forget that. Um, um, but outside of that, um, not a whole lot more in the, in the first week. Thank you. Oh, good questions. Other things? Any other things? Yes, Claudia. So Chromebooks, right? Um, would a laptop work? Or does it have to be, uh, okay. So I wasn't sure if it had to be like Windows based or uh, what is it? You know, Google based. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Peter, yes. Yeah, one more. I'm just curious, how many new students, this is an admissions questions, but how, about round numbers, how many new students are you expecting in, in you know, seventh or eighth grade, or is it in the 20s, is it in the, just a handful? I'm curious how many new newbies there'll be. I think Peter or uh, Ms. Petri would have the exact numbers. It's, it's not a handful, right? We get an influx, sixth, seventh, and eighth, and things kind of taper off 
the higher the grade level, but um, it, it's it's pretty high, um, right? Because in the Albuquerque community, everybody wants to get into Cotton, uh, justifiably so. So, Miss Petrie, I don't know if you have some some hard numbers behind that. So, seventh and eighth grade, there's very little turnover. So, uh, we're looking at less than ten new kids in the whole grade level. It's a very small number of new students. Um, we have a few more at ninth grade. Um, 11th and 12th, there's very few that join in at that level just because we're starting the IB curriculum. Um, 10th grade, we tend to have a pretty small number. I would say 9th grade is probably where we see that, you know, majority of the turnover. Um, but really, all of our new students are primarily coming from 6th grade, where we have, you know, a whole class of, of new students. But for your, your other middle school classes, it's going to be very few. But I will say they will get incorporated very quickly into their peer group. So, you know, just tell them to be patient. It takes a, a couple weeks to find their friends, but they're going to find really good friends. And, and then before you know it, you won't even be able to tell the difference between who is new and who has been at Cottonwood the whole time. Great. Thank you. Other questions, comments? All right, well, uh, I'll quickly, if you're thinking of others, um, just let us know, but I'll tell you the, the Parent Advisory Council, our group meets the second Monday of every month at 6 p.m. Uh, we welcome you to attend, it's, it's an open meeting. We usually have a few, couple, three agenda items that we hit. Um, as we're working with the administration and faculty, um, but you're welcome to join. And we're always looking for, we have a, a, a core team. It's a small but mighty group. So we're always looking to expand that. If you wanted to get involved, you can just reach out to me directly and or attend one of the meetings. That, that would be fine. The governing council meeting meets the third, the, the governing council meets the third Tuesday of every month at 5 p.m. And um, you are welcome to attend that meeting as well. There is time designated up front where uh, it's open for public comment. And so you just have to sign up for that um, and you can, make, you can make your public comment or ask questions or have dialogue with the governing council. Uh, so I encourage you to do that. That's one way to uh, come to know what's going on, particularly at that little school board level where they do make budgetary decisions and hiring you know they assist uh, mr bitter in hiring etc uh, th those kinds of sort of operational issues um so that's a good way to get to get some knowledge there as well so and um the the foundation i don't know their meeting uh, interval schedule but they do meet they do meet often as well and all that communication will come will come out to you uh, also uh Good question there. Have new COVID guidelines been received? If so, what are they at this time? Um, I am not sure about any new guidance. Um, I'll, I'll ask Ms. P3 or Jordan um, and or Peter Lukes to see if we've got any new information there. So, so we my have, understanding, oh, go ahead, please, Peter. No, please, Cody. Well, my understanding is we did get a new toolkit, but it wasn't very different than the old toolkit. Um, so I think that most of the guidelines that you all have seen at school last semester are still in place um, for this school year. Um, generally, if there's anything vastly different, our nurse will send something out to the community um, giving everybody a heads up so that they understand what those guidelines are. Um, I, I will say that um, we try to be really conscientious about cleaning between classes. Um, so teachers have um, an antiviral spray that they spray on all the desks and on, uh, you know, doorknobs and uh, high touch areas. Um, but, you know, that's, that's only happening once, once between classes. So 
you know, just be aware that uh, if, if you're concerned about COVID, your child is still <laughs> welcome to wear a mask at school. They're not required to, but they are welcome to wear that. Um, I know we have staff members that are still wearing masks just because, you know, we're, we are still hundreds of people in one building. So, um, so we just have to be, you know, conscientious of that, but, but that would be a call for your family to make at this point. It hasn't been uh, mandated um, by the state or by the school. So you, you all would need to make that choice. And, and I'll just second, or at least add to that, to just say that, um, just know that your student will feel comfortable with a mask on. Like there's not gonna be anybody to make them feel uncomfortable or vice versa. So, um, and there will be, you know, staff members like myself, I plan to wear a mask in the first couple of weeks. Um, so it's, it's not gonna cause a stigma or make anybody stand out or whatnot. Um, and and our halls are busy at passing periods because um, we don't have separate passing periods for middle school and high school and um, so it does put us all like really tight and um, and then getting out to lunch is also a busy time and, and those kind of things so um, it's 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 a worthwhile consideration thank you thank you and we're also, we've been asked to do seating charts in that, right? So that we can, so that the nurse and whatnot can follow up with contact tracing. And, and um, we put a lot of effort into that. And I, I think a lot of expertise to be, and have developed a lot of expertise on that at this point as well. So um, I think we're, you know, we're doing what we can within the requirements from the state for sure and probably beyond. Yeah, I, I will tell you also from the parent perspective, when, we were right middle of pandemic I, my son miles who was a senior at the time their kind of mantra was well we went on spring break and guess what we never came back right that was the their kind of their, their, their kind of prank if you will the school responded excellently um, in terms of how we dealt with the pandemic in a very kind caring respectful way as, as you know many differing opinions on it how things are dealt with. So again, I, I would echo uh, Peter's comment about mask or not, where, you know, whatever it might be, um, there's a great acceptance of how everyone deals with the current challenges of COVID. Um, so that, to me, that's, a, that's a, an important thing to convey, particularly from the parents, so. Other things, other comments? Sure, Peter. Just just a minor question. Could you talk a little bit about um, state standardized testing? Do you follow it? Do you um, participate? Um, anything with the, the, the state testing that you could comment on would be great. This, Ms. Petri, I'm going to give that to you. It's great being this, but I can just like play paddle ball or tennis. <laughs> I know. I was going to try to volley it to Jordan because he <laughs> had to do a lot of the standardized testing or to Mr. Meidinger. Um, yes, so we are a public school, so we are responsible for all the testing that the state requires. Um, in addition to that, we also do um, the NWEA MAP testing, uh, interim testing for our own. Um, for our own information so we can progress monitor that way. Um, the MAP testing is, is in three areas. So that test your student will get almost immediately and we're testing in grades six through ninth, um, but they will have a, a test in math and in uh, reading and language usage. Each test takes about an hour and they'll do it through their, their classes. Um, and they'll do that three times this school year. So uh, April is our big testing season. If there's any standardized testing that your child's grade level will be doing, they'll be doing it in April most likely, or uh, sometimes a, a test will sneak in in February, but most of the testing is in April. And um, we are really trying to, to consider the, having the state reduce our testing burden so that's something that um, 
John, our executive director, is is working on with the state because um, you know it's it's a lot of testing for kids when they should really be doing classroom learning. Um, but we are responsible for it as of now, and we we have to do it. Um, and we don't have a waiver for that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pizza. Anything else? Okay. You're all aware that we eat lunch outside under the big shade structure, you know, like the, and there's, and there's access to lunch and then you can bring your own, those kind of things. Lockers will come later on. So students won't have to carry everything, but for the first little while, um, students will have to carry what they need for the day. Um, we're all periods on Monday and then block schedules on Tuesday through Friday. Um, and odds and then evens on those days. So that'll help students. Students need to kind of learn that system. Even our, even our students, like that's a schedule change for us. Um, so it, it'll be a little bit of an adjustment for everybody. Um, and those blocks are pretty long. They're 90 minutes for the most part. The first period of the day on those block days is 100 so that we can do announcements and that kind of thing. Um, but, and so expect for some, you know kind of building some stamina <laughs> kids are going to come home super tired in the first couple weeks we're all exhausted in the first couple weeks so um and i think the other thing i'll throw out there for new parents to cottonwood is just like um prepare your students for being asked to use their voice um we we really um as part of paideia and um really just you know the holistic nature of of ib we really don't allow too much just sitting in the back and cruising through. Um, you really have to participate, add your own perspective, support your argument with some evidence. Um, and and especially if a student's coming in in ninth or 10th grade, um, you know, students have been working with this stuff in Socratic seminars and it'll feel like you're in an alien school for about a month and then you'll 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 get it you know and there'll be language thrown about and some acronyms and things like that but the most important part of all of it i think is really just making sure that you're doing your part and and you're participating and um really being engaged in in your own learning and 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 the learning of others really right through sharing your own perspectives and your own knowledge and that kind of thing your own interpretations of readings and that kind of thing um so and that's that I think is probably one of the things that makes Cottonwood like that would stand out for a student a lot, right? Going from a typical public school to um, to Cottonwood, um, it'll be a little bit of a shock. Thank you, Peter. So there's a question about school security, and Jordan has volunteered to take that one. Yes, security. Um, okay, so we do not have active like security presence on campus. Um, it is a relatively small campus. Uh, some things we do, though, are um, all entrances to the building are locked or secured. There's no entrances that are supposed to stay open. That's school policy. Um, all staff members are trained in your standard responses to like fire procedures, um, active shooter scenarios, things like that, right? things that happen on really bad days. Um, so I guess that's the most important thing to understand. Like there is no, you know, hired security presence, but staff is trained on what to do when things go wrong and doors are locked, so. Yeah, I, I would say as a parent, there, there's really no easy way to get in the school. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting because you are on what we call that Jefferson Corridor lots of traffic and so on, but there is little foot traffic. Um, but if you want to get to school, just, you know, serendipitously and kind of walk in, you've got to go through that front door and you have to be buzzed in and you've got the whole camera set up and all of that. And so Miss Green and the folks sitting at that very front are kind of the, the folks that grant you um, 
access. And I think I'll throw in just that, um, you know, teachers have duty assignments in that, right? And and we have duty assignments connected to like our planning periods or whatnot. So we're in the halls as well. And and um, and then morning and afternoon duty and, and that kind of thing. And I think um, at this point, every, we do have EAs that are often and and we have like our facilities managers and, and janitors and that that are also, you know, trained to be aware and are moving around the building and that kind of thing. So um, I think there's a lot of in cameras and et cetera. So there's a there's a fair bit of a certainly there's awareness. Um, but as far as like a school security officer, we don't we don't have that an SRO or something like that. I actually have a really great story about this. Um, on it was a Friday last year. Luckily, there weren't very many students on campus that day because we were doing, you know, remote Fridays last year. But um, <clears throat> a car had come in off of Jefferson um, into our parking lot and parked in the car was smoking and on fire. And this this couple got out of the car and sort of fled the scene and they had tried to get into the building. They had tried the front entrance, they had gone around the school, they had tried back entrances and they weren't able to get in. So they ended up um, just taking off. Now, I guess what that ended up being was like um, some sort of stolen car scenario over on I-40 and then they ended up peeling off and driving into the school and bailing. Um, but they had tried to get into the school to hide and they were not able to do so. So it, it stays pretty locked down. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, it is. It is. The, the, there's a, a question about um, students completing a health course online through BYU. How long does this take and to complete and when is the expected time to be completed. I, I don't have any information on that. Um, I'll, I'll take it. Um, the the BYU courses, to be perfectly honest, are um, a little bit overly simple. So the answer to how long it takes is um, how dedicated you are to it. Um, and it could take a matter of like consistent work on it for an hour a day and you could be done in a couple weeks. Um, it's, it's a high school graduation requirement as per the state, so it has to be done before you graduate. Um, the expectation is um, that that calendar or school year, right, is is to get it done and get it off your plate. Um, and you also probably want to check in if you haven't already with the registrar about um, any other um, requirements that that may be necessary to pick up. But I think that's that's the most important one coming in as a ninth grader. That's the one that most students won't be able to fit into their school day schedule um, in high school. Sure. Claudia, yes. Yes. Thank you. So going back to the BYU, you said they, it, it takes about an hour yeah, it's a, it, it depends really on how much time you dedicate to it. So um, it will not take you, if you spend an hour a day, it will not take you all semester. It'll go quickly. Where can, where, when is you going to take that class? We didn't know about uh, is it this. Is school or class? like homework? Or? Oh, yeah. Um, That'll depend on whether or not you have a study hall in your schedule. Um, you can do it during the school day, but um, you're coming in as a ninth grader, so most likely not. And um, so then it would be on your own time. Okay. Thank you. Teresa, am I speaking out of school on that one? Does that, does that sound right? No, that doesn't sound right. And, and the BYU, you know, I would say, you're probably looking at about 10 to 15 hours total. So I'm sure this is saying if you just, you know, kind of 
kind of buckle down and, and somebody can get through pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, it, it can take a little bit longer depending on, you know, other factors. Um, don't watch YouTube while you do it. <laughs> That'll distract you. There's lots of videos embedded in it. So uh, you'll just have to kind of focus your, while you're on those lessons. But um, but they they are something that you sign up um, for with Miss Geertz. There is a fee for them because they are separate um, from Cottonwood. They're provided by um, the University BYU. Um, and we use them for our credit recovery. So just, you know, be aware that there will be a fee for those classes as well. And then once, um, once uh, our teacher that monitors the class, once she lets Ms. Gear to know that the final has been taken and the class completed, then that'll get added to um, your student's transcript and the grade will be recorded there. And, and our, our incoming ninth graders always do have a little bit of credit recovery because we start our high school classes in eighth grade at Cottonwood. So, uh, and you guys will hear, you'll hear me talk about this during Jumpstart, but in eighth grade, our students are taking the Algebra One class, uh, the high school Algebra One class, high school biology, they have high school Spanish, they have um, health, and they have New Mexico history. So they go into high school with quite a few um, credit. So if you're coming in as a ninth grader above, you will have a little bit of credit recovery to do so that you're prepared for the IB program um, in 11th grade. Sure, Peter. Uh, on that note, um, coming in as an eighth grader with the algebra, could you talk a little bit about the level of support or like a how you're monitoring a student coming in from maybe a curriculum a little behind uh, where the rest of the Cottonwood class may be with that that foundation that they would have received in sixth and seventh coming in, you know, um, uh, any any comments on that from one of the teachers might be useful. Well, I, Mr. I teach... are... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Hi. I teach uh, eighth grade algebra one. And as you mentioned, uh, quite a number of our students are have been in our system for a while. And for the new ones, we I'm not entirely certain what the what the placement criteria are for an incoming student. I could let somebody speak to that in a minute. But if they get into my classroom or into our classroom, we of course we know who who the new students are, and we make sure that we put enough supports in there that we that we interface with them enough that we get a feel for their readiness and and we share with we share with them sort of what what's been covered in previous years so that they can get a feel for and a, and a confidence in their own ability to to keep up but we but we scaffold we support we make sure to work with them diligently thank you I would also say for math that there's weekly math tutoring. Um, so I I have a child at the school and I make her go to math tutoring every week. Um, it's really helpful and um, there's always math teachers available to help. Um, and then um, in terms of extra support beyond that, um, based on those math scores, if, um, and, and I'm the one that, that determines this along with classroom teachers, um, if MAP scores show students below grade level, um, I will have them take an intervention class during their study hall so that they have an extra block of math or we also have English intervention um, for extra support. And we have found doing that and having kids work at grade level um, and keeping in those grade level classes, kids will get up to grade level um, much more quickly than if they were to be put into a remedial type class. And that's, it's really a, it's a good practice. It's what research says works better. Um, and so we, we do that. It's not easy for kids who um, struggle a little bit. They make great things. And so that's been a very successful um, practice at Cottonwood. 
Ms. Petrie, can I ask a question? This is Clara Moran off of what you said. I think that's really exciting news, especially because I have two girls. As you know, we're so excited. Yes, two girls. Clara. Hi, it's great to see you. Good to um, see you too. I'm so excited. Both of them are coming in, but they are coming from a school where, of course, and I, you know, I've, I've expressed this before, I'm concerned that they are going to be a little bit behind and they know that we have a lot of work to do. But those intervention classes, are those taught online or is there um, a teacher who comes comes in to or one of the teachers who spends time during those study periods with the students for those intervention courses. Yeah, so if so if your student um, is, is testing below the 30th percentile, uh, either in math or language arts, um, then we'll place them in an intervention class um, with um, a teacher certified in that subject area. That's very important to us. It's a small group class, less than 15 kids. Um, and so they'll, they'll be with one of our math or English teachers if they are below 30 percentile. Um, that's not really a lot of kids. Um, so it's more likely that, you know, they won't test below the 30th percentile. And in that case, you know, I would really just say to keep up with going to math tutoring, um, you know, every week, working with teachers, you know, just making sure that the teachers are aware of, of, you know, the questions and the struggles so that they can keep working with them. Um, okay. That, that would be my suggestion. Now, so it sounds like they're only allowed in if they're testing under the 30th percentile, but if there's already a group in progress, could we elect to send them to that, to that class? Or would it be beneficial, as you said, just to continue with the tutoring? Or is that something that the tutors could even recommend, which is maybe there's an intervention class in progress? So, you know, it, I would really suggest, you know, giving it at least a few weeks um, and we can look at MAP scores and teachers can have a better sense if, t if students need an intervention. And then at that point, it would just be, you know, looking at that data and also, uh, you know, if they're not testing below the 30th percentile, then we just have the parent recommendation for an intervention if that's necessary. Um, so we, we try to look at all of those different data points before we put a student in an intervention. Um, most of our students, I would say, do fairly well in the general program, even our new students. Um, but if there is more support needed, then um, the intervention class is an option. But it, it does have the the qualifications are pretty strict just because, you know, we really have this small group we need to get up to grade level. Okay, thank you. Sure. I just want to put a plug out there for some of the, I guess, what extracurriculars, let's call them. Um, we have really successful science Olympiad teams. We have... Um, also very successful speech and debate, mock trial, um, and then athletics from kind of run the gamut in NMAA. The one the one athletic we do that's not NMAA um, is a co-ed charter school soccer league. But other than that, we've got really successful teams in track, cross country, basketball, both men and women, volleyball, golf. Um, golf's usually a little smaller. Mr. Ben Avery, do you want to plug eSports? Yeah, last year esports won uh, second place in the state for League of Legends, which I was running last year. I don't believe I'm running it this year, but we're hoping to still have an esports program. So, I, I'm about to say, as a parent, the coolest thing about our track team and our cross country team is we might have a meet, um, you know, in various cities around the state that might be. 50 to 75 miles away and sure enough mr lukes will show up not because he drove there but because he ran there that morning um so he's kind of a, an iron horse when it comes when it comes to that so look for him at any one of those uh, events um and Connected to the Battle of the Books comment in the chat, um, another middle school um, one that we, we've been successful with has been uh, Math Counts as well. Um, and we have um, older students, you know, like seniors supporting the uh, middle schoolers in that competition with teacher support, but 
largely guided by um, very accomplished seniors. Other questions? I know we are uh, a little bit past our time, but um, we can take a few more minutes, of course, and address any other comments or questions. All right. Well, uh, many thanks to Ms. Petrie and Mr. Lutz. Uh, Jordan, thank you so much for being here. I know it's been a long day for you. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time and willingness to field questions, and, and, and David as well, uh, our math teacher, for, for sharing um, all of your, your, your wisdom and advice and counsel to our new parents. So, uh, again, do reach out to me if you need anything, any of your new parents. Uh, it's pat at cottonwoodclassical.org. If I don't have the answer for you, I will certainly point you in the right direction. Uh, it's been a pleasure meeting all of you and spending some time with you. Have a great uh, upcoming first day of the school year and look forward to meeting you in person soon. Thank you all. Take care, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Welcome everyone. Thank you. <laughs>